Uh, let me welcome everybody to the Future Trends Forum. I'm very glad to see you all here today in order to explore a vital and extraordinary subject. My name is Brian Alexander. I'm the forum's creator, coast, and chief cat herder, and I'll be your guide for the next hour of conversation. But before we begin that conversation, let me introduce the forum and explain a little bit about how it works, where it came from, and share a little bit of news about how we work. So first of all, the forum has been going on for almost five years now. Uh, we've been doing every week a video conference discussion. And again, when I say discussion, I mean that. These are conversations. We don't have presentations. But what I'm doing here with these slides is just for a minute to just introduce the program. Otherwise, it's entirely face-to-face -face and face-to-voice conversation. That's the goal here. That's how we work. Now, we've been doing this for a while. And we've been doing it with the help of some generous supporters who I'd like to thank before we proceed. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank NizerNet from New York State, uh, a great nonprofit that helps that state's colleges and universities get online and do great things with each other via broadband. We're really excited about their work and delighted they could sponsor us. We're also grateful to Shindig because, as you can see, they make the technology we're using right now. So if you're new to Shindig uh, or if you haven't been here for a while, let me just show you a couple of the key points. Uh, first of all, where I am and where the slide is, again, just for a minute, is called the stage. And we call it the stage because everybody involved in this conversation can see and hear everything that goes on on stage. You can join us here and I'll show you how to do that. Now, right below us, you can see around you about 20 people at a time. Uh, we call this the uh, participant swarm. Uh, and you can see that on either side of your screen, you should have a button like a chevron. If you click that button, that lets you hop into different rooms. We divide the entire space into individual rooms of about 20. Right now, we have 124 people, so that's a good number of rooms. Now, if you'd like to participate, how can you have these conversations, these discussions I was just talking about? Well, there are two major ways. If you look in the bottom of your screen, you'll see a few different buttons. The two ones I want you to pay attention to are a raised hand button and a question mark. If your video camera is working and your mic is working and you're in a place where you can talk out loud, click the raised hand button when you want to join us on stage. I'll see you, and then with two button presses, I'll bring you up on stage so we can have a conversation. It's really easy to do. Now, if your microphone doesn't work, if your camera doesn't work, or you're not in a place where you can talk, that's okay. Click the question mark button. That lets you type in a question or a remark, and then I can relay that to the whole crowd once the time is right. In fact, I'll flash it on the screen for everyone to read, and then I'll read it out loud so everyone can hear it. So either way, click the raised hand or click the question mark, and that feeds your comments and questions right in. Now, if you're on Twitter, just make sure you use the hashtag FTTE, and people often tweet out from inside, or they tweet uh, out to tweet at us if they can't make it, but they still want to follow on Twitter. So those are the main ways you can participate. We'd love to hear from you. This, this entire program is like soil and green. It's made out of people. It's made out of you. And we would just love to hear your thoughts and ideas. We're grateful to Shindig for making available the technology that powers it all. We're also grateful to our supporters on uh, Patreon. And let me just show them so you can see all these great people. Patreon is a crowdfunding site where you can collaboratively fund any kind of creative ongoing work. And in this case, it's our work in trying to grapple the future of education. People kick in as little as a dollar a month just to keep the lights on, the machines humming. You can see these people here contribute $10 or more a month. These are great people like Corey S., Lisa Pritchard, Francine Hibiscus, Laura Armour, Trent Batson, Chris Johnson, Paul Hanley. We're really grateful to them for their support, and you can join them. Just go to patreon.com slash Brian Alexander. Now, this week, and for the past few weeks, we've been in an extraordinary situation. We've been dealing with a pandemic that has afflicted the globe. You can see here from the latest data that the number of human beings infected is reported to be 1.5 million and rising. We're approaching a death toll of nearly 100,000. This is obviously an extraordinary event that's reshaping the world in all kinds of ways. But it's especially impacting higher education, which is why I want to talk about it today. Now, in order to do that, uh, I asked everybody last week, uh, I sent out a survey asking some, some directions about what you would like to see in the future transform moving ahead. And these are the major topics that people wanted us to focus on. Planning for the next year, equity and student access, teaching online and technology issues. And we'll be touching on it. The first one is the theme for today, and we'll keep following up on that. Now, 
I want to share a couple other findings from the survey, which again, I'm really grateful to the folks who, uh, who responded to it. One of them was we asked, what kind of format would you like for our coronavirus future transform sessions? And the leading answer was a panel of experts, which is what we're doing today. And we're going to follow up on that with more and more panels. <clears throat> we also asked, okay, after a month of focusing on COVID-19, should we keep that laser-like focus going on? And a slim majority said, yes, keep focusing on the pandemic and what it means for our education. And coming in a very, very close second, though, was the opinion that we should alternate between COVID-19 news and other topics. So I'm going to mesh that and try and do something like every four weeks, one week of something other than COVID. And we'll keep going with that. We also asked people how you would like to discuss these issues between sessions, and Twitter really took the lead. That was the main way people wanted to have these conversations. So we can focus on that, again, using the hashtag FTTE. So that's it for the survey. Thank you so much for your opinions and thoughts. They really, they, as you can tell, they're shaping our programming. So please let us know more. We're glad to hear from all of them. If you'd like to see some resources on the COVID-19 crisis in higher education, just go to tinyurl.com slash COVID edu. You can find some there. So today, our goal is to zero in on the academic year 2020, 2021. We wanna think about what it means to be teaching during or right after the pandemic this time next year. So we're going beyond the summer session, we're going beyond spring 2020, we're looking ahead at the full year. What does it mean to have students return to campus after a pandemic, or what does it mean to have no students on campus because we're still on lockdown? Or what happens if during the fall semester, we oscillate between having some people on campus, no people on campus, lots of people on campus, what changes with our technology? What changes with our education? How does this impact research and student life? Now to discuss this, we have a whole set of great, great people. And I wanna just bring them up one at a time on stage because they're all just awesome folks. Um, and I'm gonna start off with uh, a dear friend and a great uh, supporter of the program, uh, Robin DeRosa, who is coming to us from Plymouth State University. Robin, Hi. greetings. Hi, Brian. Hi, everybody. Oh, I'm so glad to see you. Where, where are you today, by the way? Uh, I am in my home in central New Hampshire near the university where I teach, which is Plymouth State University. Okay. And uh, I should ask as a, you know, a kind of New England question, what's the weather like? Um, it is gray, gloomy, and sleeting, um, which is a reflection of my soul. <laughs> oh, no. no. At the moment. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Um, well, that also sounds like spring, doesn't it? It does, yeah. Okay, okay. Um, well, Robin, I, I would love to talk with you and ask you all kinds of questions. And I, I wanna start off with one just really quickly. Um, describe the impact of this pandemic on Plymouth State University. How, where are you all now? How have you reacted? Um, honestly, I'm gonna have to say it's, um, it's personally, socially, and institutionally traumatizing um, mm. at this point. Um, so we are a very rural campus, a public college, mm -hmm. and um, in one of the lowest funded uh, states in the nation. Um, and so we were already having sort of budget trouble, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but in some ways, our rural location means that the virus itself hasn't hit us quite as hard as some of the more urban parts of the country. So we don't have a lot of students or faculty yet who are ill, although we're just starting to hear about people's family members, especially in the southern part of the state that borders on Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but what happened uh, to our students in particular and to a lot of their uh, family members is that immediately when the state went on some version of, of lockdown, you know, we, we can quibble about all the different uh, terms, but they did shut down most non-essential businesses. And that meant that almost overnight, um, many of my students and many of their family members lost their jobs. And Ooh. what we found, which really shocked me was, um, the scope of it really shocked me, was people who had been living paycheck to paycheck and doing um, fine uh, mm -hmm. were suddenly within a week, Brian, just 
thrust into um, not just poverty, but a real sense of what will happen to me tomorrow. Like, where will I be living? How will I be eating? How will I pay um, if I get sick and I need medical attention? Um, and so overnight as a faculty member, um, that was what I was hearing from, from students. And it was kind of far from my mind to figure out how to get them dealing with remote learning, which is a whole other issue up here. We have lots of people, um, as you remember, Brian, from your time in uh, Vermont, um, where rural broadband is, uh, is not super accessible to a lot of people, but also people can't afford um, wireless outside of the packages they may have had when they were living on campus. So when campus shut and they went home, they were pretty disconnected from us. Um, but honestly, that was so secondary to the fact that Many of them didn't even know where they were going to go home to. Um, they had, for example, elderly or ill family members um, uh, at home, and they didn't know if they should be traveling back there. They couldn't afford to get back. Uh, they didn't have cars to get back. Um, and just suddenly, uh, especially with food insecurity, we just had massive problems of that scale. Uh, that was what I spent pretty much my first two weeks on. Um, it also affected some of our um, faculty members as well who didn't have reliable internet access um, and mm -hmm. had had issues dealing with their families. So I've been mm -hmm. trying to pay attention to online learning pivots, uh, but really for a lot of us, um, this has been a real foregrounding of the basic needs issues that our students and even contingent faculty deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. And that's what we've been focusing on a lot. Oh, I imagine this is this sounds like a, a, a natural disaster, like a, a terrible storm or a flood. Yeah, I mean, we we were lucky to get a grant from Sarah Goldrick Grabs Fast Fund, and um, yeah. in in one day, we students applied and we dispersed eight thousand dollars in emergency need um it was gone mm -hmm. as soon as it was out there um and it was just the beginning of the of the need um so i think one of the questions that a lot of us are dealing with is um what role do basic needs play in academia how much of, of academic issue are these concerns and what should faculty and staff who normally maybe don't spend the better part of their day working on these things. What do we need to be doing now to make sure that our communities are taken care of and that we're prepared if this is gonna be ongoing? Wow, um, this is a story that needs to be told and I'm glad you could tell it here, Robin. Um, and knowing, knowing your fierce energy, your commitment to justice and to learning, um, I'm so glad you're there uh, helping them. Um, yeah, and I, I just maybe want to say one more thing too, which is that um, I know people are here, like you know, watching me right now. That's what I've been doing the last few days. I've been signing up for every webinar with every hopeful answer on how we're going to navigate this, and have been depressed at the end of all of them because there aren't answers. And I think what I just keep coming back to <clears throat> is the sense that. We have a public health crisis right. and we need a healthy public response. And mm. some of that needs to come from those of us who do public education. And the, the response isn't gonna be an answer. It's going to be thinking about, thinking about the public good the same way we think about social distancing. You stay home, not just for yourself, but for those in your community who are vulnerable. Yeah. I think if we can just all adopt the mindset that we're not going to fix this or solve this or come up with some remote learning panacea, what we really need to do is to think about our communities and about particularly if you're not affected or 10 students in your class are not affected and they're learning and everything's great, focus on the two or three who are off the map. Focus on the four or five who are struggling to get their assignments in because it's those margins that make a public, you know, it, it, the people with all the privilege in the world, they're going to make it through this, you know, God willing, their health holds out. Um, but we need to, to find a way to not let this pandemic augment the sorting, yeah. sorting effects of higher ed, um, because otherwise we're just going to leave behind 
whole institutions worth of people who deserve to learn. They do. That's a powerful, powerful, I was gonna say almost a prayer. Um, it's a powerful sentiment, um, especially thinking of the public good and thinking of the most marginalized among us. Well, I, I want you to hold that, hold that thought for a second and everybody else start thinking of questions for Robin. But I need to bring up on stage another member of our panel. Uh, this is the absolutely splendid journalist, Goldie Blumenstick from the Chronicle of Higher Education. Hello, Goldie. Hey, Brian, how are you? Good. Nice to meet you. Good to see you. Have you met Robin before? Uh, no, I haven't. Oh, you absolutely should know each other. Uh, you're too splendid. Hello. Um, Goldie, are you in DC right now? I am sitting in my apartment right now. Oh, great. I'm out from my office, but nowhere near it. I mean, in many ways, nowhere near it. We've all got, we went remotely at the Chronicle in the second week of March. Which is very, very smart. Mm -hmm. uh, Goldie, I, I have all kinds of questions for you. <laughs> and I, I know everybody else is. And let me, let me just tell everybody else before I start interrogating you, this is the time to start clicking the raised hand button or to click the question mark. Uh, when you, you know, the, what Robin has just been describing, what she's just been recommending, and what Goldie's about to say is go, these are going to give rise to all kinds of questions and comments from you. So please uh, start thinking about that. Start, pressing those buttons. Goldie, uh, looking ahead, thinking about fall semester, what are you seeing from American higher education? What kind of, what kind of visions are we uh, floating for what fall might look like? What kind of planning are we doing? You know, the biggest question, the, the biggest thing right at everyone's facing right now is the absolute uncertainty. Um, I don't know any more than anybody else knows right now, but talking as I'm reading all the medical stuff, and I have members of my family are on the front lines of this as well. Yeah. Um, I find it really hard to believe that fall is going to start like a normal fall. I I, mm. I can't imagine students coming back together in the numbers that students come back to campuses in. I can't imagine sports teams playing in stadiums. It's, I mean, I would love to be wrong, but and I like I said, I don't know. You know, <laughs> my information now is not as is no better than anybody else's, but it's. Based on what I'm seeing, I don't. I feel it's very optimistic for people to be saying that, and probably unrealistic to think about a natural, normal fall. Do you think? Um, do you think we were? Let me rephrase that. Do you see colleges and universities uh, trying to uh, plan for a, a fall that's entirely online, a continuation of where we are now, or do you see them planning to start welcoming students back? I mean, honestly, what right now they're thinking that they're. I think they're only starting to turn to thinking about the future maybe this week or next week. The last month has been like, as um, Robin just described, all consuming with just getting themselves distributed, getting their students distributed, getting you know these remote learning structures up and running. Um, I, the people I spoke to this week for the newsletter that I do were starting to worry a lot more about enrollment now, but they still, you know, they're still trying to sort of figure out what this year looks like before they start to next year. And they don't have a lot of leeway on that, frankly, but there's so much, you know, state colleges don't know what a budget's going to look like, so it's very hard to think about what your fall is going to look like. I think most boards generally vote their tuition and, you know, their, their, uh, they know their class right around, you know, they set their tuition in March, they vote their class, they admit a class in May. I mean, I don't think colleges are going to know what their freshman class is until, you know, until that count comes in at the end of September when you have to tell the ed department how many students you have. So. Good point. I've, you know, I've seen some people talking about, you know, starting this semester maybe in six-week bites instead of having a full fall semester, maybe yeah. half semester compressed courses and then the second half of the semester. That's yeah. so, I know there are a few schools that do that already. That's probably a logical way to think about the semester and um, you can't make long-term plans, so maybe you make incremental plans and you keep mm. So it's almost like a block or a quarter system. Yeah, uh, I mean, there are the schools that, I mean, the quarter system is what allow places like University of Washington and some of those other places to sort of make that quick pivot that they did. I, I mean, not everybody's sort of set up to co completely convert their courses that way in a few weeks, but I can sort of see some version of that happening right off the bat because nobody wants to keep doing this the way they're doing it, right? They want to be able to re return campus to as much normalcy as they can as soon as they can. So maybe the way to do that there's is to try to do it in increments and, you know, not, Okay. Uh, I'm saying this from a colleague of mine who stole it from somebody else, but they, you know, in talking in general about how you turn on the economy, they said it wasn't a switch, it was a dial. Um, and that's probably going to be true for colleges as well. Okay, so if we were at 10 
um, in February, we might and say we're at one right now. We're gonna we'll be dialed up to three, and then maybe four or five in the fall. Yeah, yeah. I don't know what I don't know what you know. Luckily me, I don't have to be the one to turn the dial. Um, but but you you are one of the best observers of just where the dial is. I I, I think. Just the logic of this is, I mean, we're thinking about it as a company too. What, you know, we're already thinking about, or, you know, are we going to be having events in the fall or are we going to be having virtual events in the fall? You know, yeah. I, I just, I mean, I feel like the higher ed has been so responsible. Oh, sorry. That's the today's spammer calling me. Um, oh, good. Sign of life. I have to turn it on and turn them off. Um, how many, we're all getting spammers like crazy, right? And who knew? Um, I feel like higher ed was the most responsible and very early on in sort of moving and sort of almost setting the setting the rhythm for the country. I remember going home to New Jersey to see my family for a couple of days right after all of higher ed started to shut down. And that had not really seeped into the rest of the consciousness yet. So I do think colleges will be among the most responsible um, parties in how they sort of reopen the economy. You know, I think they, <laughs> Because they have the science on their side, because they have the liability on their side, they'll probably be able to make these decisions in a, in a comprehensive way. I think that might it might be good for the whole country to be looking a little bit more closely at higher ed and how it makes these decisions. To uh, although I guess the NBA was a little ahead of the NCAA in this case. But. <laughs> well, this is fantastic. You've touched on a whole series of, of, of events from the incremental changes to the great uncertainty to um, the leadership role that higher education could play. And a whole series of questions have just come on in. And I, I want to relay these to uh, the two of you, Robin and Goldie. And then we have a third panelist I want to bring up in a minute. But first, uh, this is a question from Frank Anastasio. Uh, Frank, let's see. Greetings, sir. Uh, your your mic is on, or your mic is muted. There we go. Hi, Frank Perfect. Anastasio. Thank you. Um, I, I was interested in your in your last comment, um, Goldie, regarding the reaction of um, the universe, the higher ed institutions. Um, how much of that do you think was associated with the timing occurring around spring break? In many cases, uh, it certainly helped. A, it helped a ton. I mean. I, I, I wasn't paying that closely attention to it right from the start there, but when, after I went back and I talked to a bunch of uh, colleges who had made that online pivot, I realized what everyone had done was basically played with that two weeks of spring break. They either expanded spring break, they moved it up, they moved it back. Having that in that, I mean, that I think saved the, I mean, saved the semester for most places because they were able, they had that, they had that break coming up. Um, okay, and if you don't mind, I have, I have another question. This is a little more general. Um, you know, I, I think, um, first of all, I've, I'm a, a senior IT consultant. I've done work in, in higher ed. And I, I thought that in most cases, the, you know, again, the reaction, clearing the campuses, moving to the remote model of, of delivering uh, classes and content uh, was great. But having having worked for a learning company before, one of the things that you know, I, I, I thought came to the fore was um, the lack of instructional design, content design kinds of um, resources to help the um, teaching staff, faculty, develop the right kind of materials for a remote. Oh, man, give, give them a break. Work, right? Give these people a break. They were doing it in like two weeks. Oh, I understand. I understand. But... <laughs> You know, they're um, at least the the uh, CIOs that I talk to uh, as part of my practice um, feel like that that as we look to the future, that would that's an area that we need to beef up. You, you know, yeah, I, I, I might jump in too and just say um, one thing. I hope uh, again, this is part of like let's generate a public response to a public health crisis. I'd like to see us um, fund our teaching and learning centers and our instructional design and internal academic tech teams mm. um, to develop the kinds of infrastructure that we need to do this work effectively, which is two parts, right? It's the academic technology, but it's also that faculty development right. to help our people work. And I'd like to see us go there as opposed to the OPM ed tech 
solutionism of sort of purchasing something off the off the shelf that can somehow save you. I think the best thing we can do is organically integrate this kind of learning with the missions that we already have for teaching and learning at our institutions. And that demands faculty and staff working together to create those systems. And I'll just say, um, you know, where I am, that's that's my job. And mm -hmm. I have uh, effectively one person who yeah. works for me. So we had a pretty heavy lift uh, in making this shift. And I think better funding there would be really important. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. It's a great question, Frank. Thank you very much. You know, I've been very careful to call this as remote learning and not distance education or online education, because I think everybody knows what we're doing right now is, in most cases, very makeshift. So there's even a new consortium of the, the four organizations that are really involved with quality issues in, in online mm -hmm. learning who want to make sure that one of them called it, duct you know, duct tape education. This is not the du this duct tape version of, um, that's um, Bob, Bob Hansen from UPSIA. This duct tape version of what ha what's happening now is not actually online education. And you're absolutely right. You know, there needs to be, so much more of instructional designers and intentionality when we're developing these kinds of courses. But let's just be real, you know, in two weeks, you're not going to get that. No, um, it's remarkable what we've done. Uh, if, if you're, by the way, if you're new to the forum, uh, what you just saw was the uh, video question. Um, so if, you, if you'd like to do that, just press the raise hand button. Uh, we also have people pressing the question mark. And I want to share a couple of those questions right now and give Robin and Gold a chance to uh, uh, bounce on them. Uh, Eric Mystery asks, how does a different fall start impact schools, particularly those that depend on revenue from housing, food, fees, et cetera? Great question, Eric. Uh, they're in trouble. <laughs> I mean, I... In Next many, question. I mean, that's... that's. I mean, they... I mean, our school is facing a $13 million spring shortfall, our tiny public institution, $13 million spring shortfall, you know, just from the prorating of the um, room and board when it's left. So that's a huge issue. Yeah, and when you're not serving food, you're, that's money that you're not spending. You may be employing the workers still, but you know, the housing costs are still there. And those, right. those bonds need to be paid off either way, right? Oh, that's, um, that's unfortunately a great question. And uh, thank you both for the really concise and spot on answers. Uh, we have another question coming in from uh, Van Davis um, at WSDT. Van, hi. Oh, your, your mic is muted. No, it's seriously muted now. <laughs> I can see you and I think you can hear us, but uh, we can't hear you. Uh, tell you what, uh, why don't you um, type in a question and I'll, I'll bring it up on stage. Thanks, Van. Um, we have a whole bunch of, of questions coming in. I want to make sure we get a chance to uh, address these. Uh, this is one that's come in from, uh, whoops, sorry, just this one. This is from Tom Hames, <clears throat> longtime friend of the program. Um, and uh, he asks, how do we prepare for an unnatural fall while maintaining quality? I mean, I might start by saying um, the modality, whether online, face-to-face, -face, hybrid, blended, high flex, whatever you're looking at, um, that's not the only consideration for what makes quality. So I'm just encouraging institutions to think about their mission and their pedagogical approach in general what is that? And that's the thing that we want to preserve in quality. So there's more questions than just how do I create a good engaging video? How do I make good online assessments? How do I transition from face to face to Zoom? Those are all great things and we should talk about them. <clears throat> but also important is um, what are the pedagogical models I've been using so far? What do they think what do they count as important in the connection between learners and teachers and how can I bring those into an online environment? Yeah. So I think we spend a little bit too much time looking at how the content translates into a new modality and not quite enough time thinking about what are the ways we want to connect with learners? What, you know, 
I think a lot of our quality models, personalized learning competency-based models, but that's not the pedagogy that a lot of our residential institutions have. So how do we build project-based, inquiry-based, collaborative spaces? Um, start with those basic questions, and I think that's a kind of quality that I really care about beyond just the kinds of assessments we've used to decide whether someone's ready because do they know enough technology to get themselves online? That's a great answer. Um, that's that's exactly right. What worries me is the other constraints that are out there that are going to make that even harder. Like I can, you know, real world experience is the thing that we always talk about. Try to integrate what your classroom experience is, is you know, take it to a real world experience, take it back to your job. And well, what if we're still in social distancing in the fall and you can't go do real field work by not, you know, or doing some of this other stuff. Um, I mean, it, it, I, I agree with you 100% that there's a lot that can that can be modified even beyond the tech. I, I was really struck by, um, some of you may know Phil Hill who does a newsletter and he wrote this analysis this week and he talked about, you know, right off the bat, it seems like a lot of the transitions have been, you know, just people who don't, aren't familiar with teaching online have just tried to recreate their class right. in a Zoom. And obviously that's the makeshift, you know, thing that you do right now to make it ready. I mean, no, no professor is going to have it easy in the fall if they have to do this because they have to think about what the constraints are for their students right now too. Not least of which is if everyone's still working from home, and this is the thing that really, I heard this from uh, Bill, Cres Bill Moses from Kresge when I interviewed the philanthropists um, mm -hmm. for the Edge newsletter a couple weeks ago. Mm -hmm. He talked about just thinking, and not just the broadband access, let's say you have broadband at home and let's say you have a laptop and you're the adult student. Well, suddenly you're the adult student who has to compete with your child for the laptop time. And you know what worked initially to just get you, get everybody staying in school is now not gonna work just because of circumstances. Uh -huh. well, Absolutely. I, that's, a, that's a great answer. I and mean, between the two of you, a question of constraints, which are manifold, um, and then this, pedagogical idea to recreate <clears throat> or to create what actually works best pedagogically. Now, these are brilliant. Within these constraints, right. Yeah, uh, innovation under constraint. We have uh, more questions just piling in, and now we have Jill uh, Yashikawa from Creative Marbles. Hello, Jill. Hello, thank you for having me. Um, uh, one of my questions, so we work with students um, K through 12 and all the way through college. And so, um, Rosa, when you were talking about the connections between professors and students, um, that has been the most impactful that we have been hearing from our students is that when teachers are human and say, hey, we're all trying to figure this out together, let's try and work on this. Because what we know as educators is that it's the connection, not necessarily just the content. It's the trust that a student has with their teacher to be able to know that that person has their best interests in mind, but also is human and imperfect. And I think that's what makes a difference because what we're doing is we're, we're balancing on the goodwill of students right now. We have evicted them from campus. We have disrupted their education, what they expected they were going to get. And now we've told them to go home and be back in their childhood bedrooms with their parents. And they're not getting the college experience that they want. And when families are, when professors are real in that way, then students can have a greater trust because, and here's my question, so is what is that goodwill? How do we keep developing that trust so they'll come back in the fall or they'll continue to endure a disruption? And then for our seniors who are now in the midst of choosing, and I'm in California, so I have students choosing colleges all over the country, and their families are concerned. Why would I send my kid to New York City when that there's a huge outbreak there and I can't even go see the campus? How do we help these, everybody have trust so that we have an institution of enrollment. Because as you've both mentioned, there is gonna be financial difficulty um, coming back, especially for state funded institutions that those states may have economic uncertainty themselves and tuition may have to raise. So that, that's really my question is, what do we do now so that we preserve that goodwill instead of just banking on that it's going to be back when you know, things get back to normal? Thank you, Joe. It's a great question. I mean, wow. the, the one thing I'm, <laughs> when I, I've been thinking a lot about what makes for a resilient campus and uh, 
sort of came up with the conclusion that it's the same thing that makes for a resilient college graduate, which is, you know, dealing with complexity, dealing with ambiguity, <laughs> um, especially dealing with ambiguity. I, I think in some cases, if this is kind of goes against what colleges like to do. They, especially this time of the year, colleges sort of like to, you know, put the bravado out and they're, they're the best and everyone should come put their deposits down with them. But right. I think it's really incumbent on college leaders to be very um, forthright and do a lot of communicating with their various constituencies about what they know, to, to quote a uh, famous defense secretary, the known, the known unknowns and the knowns and the, you know, they just need to be clear about what they have and don't have in, in hand. And I think the schools that are being straightforward about it will be reward, well, people will recognize that and appreciate it. And the schools that are trying to BS their way through it are going to pay the price for it at some point. So, I mean, if you can't tell somebody whether it's safe to come to New York City in the fall, you should be able to sort of say that or just say, Here's what we're trying to do right now. I mean, and just go into this with the same kind of the goodwill that Ram was talking about right from the start. I mean, no, these are not, you know, places. These are places that are trying to do something in the public good. I think they just have to be really communicate, really communicate honestly and directly and from, you know, probably from the top. And, and I think um, institutions will be served best by seeking frameworks rather than solutions. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the things I've been trying to work out um, in my own institution uh, is kind of a, a framework for, so we were, I was thinking about sort of three organizing ideas of um, equity, access, and connection. Focus on a framework that matches your demographic and your institutional mission and make sure everybody's literate in that framework um, and then speak from and through that framework. But that I think allows this to be a process that unfolds with students and families as partners rather than as something that we present to them as, don't worry, we've got it all figured out. We're doing ABC solution. So if we think of it as a process and we tell them we're not we're not flying by the seat of our pants. We have a framework. It's uh, it's based on something that we've been generating for years because we understand our students and we understand teaching and learning. And now we've adapted that framework for this situation and here's how that looks. But that's different than saying we know exactly what's gonna happen, right? It just says we understand our values. And like for us at Plymouth, I'm really thinking uh, based on our history as a teacher's college and serving some underserved populations, our values are really around you know equity access um and and collaboration community um, but what a, is it for your institution i think that's a really important word values because i'm thinking about it like you know i've talked to a lot of residential college uh, leaders this week and you know but what is the value of the residential college experience yeah it's physically being there but there's something that's achieved from that residential experience and maybe there's a way to replicate that in some way if you're not in the physical space. Especially because we don't see this as a permanent thing, which like, thank you right. for yeah. silver linings, right? Um, so the idea right. I mean, is like, we, there will be a vaccine. There That's will right. be a vaccine. There will be, it will be safer to be in groups at, soon, at some point. It just, exactly. When we want it to it's be. It's an emergency. But it's not forever. But you know, honestly, I think, I'm not looking for a silver lining in this because there really isn't one, but well, and I don't trust the people who say that there is one, frankly. But it, there is some flex. There are some questions about the model in general, about picking up all these people, moving them all to one place, and then you know, there's probably there probably should have been a little bit more flexibility in the model all along. A little bit more uh, notions about sort of a more porous approach. That's the right word. Maybe it's not, but um, and it might just. So I think that that thinking was already being accelerated as technology has advanced and as concerns about you know our impact on the climate have have advanced you know have entered our consciousness. This might accelerate that a little bit at some point. And I'm not saying that, that that's in any way welcome news right now, but no, that's a connection we're going to cycle back to. Um, <laughs> Jill, thank you so much for a great question, um, and uh, uh, we'd love to hear more from you later on from Creative Marbles. Um, thank you, uh, Goldie and Robin. Um, you're being fantastic guests. You're, I, I love these answers. This is, uh, and also, of course, Twitter loves them as well, uh, which is great to see. Um, 
But we have another panelist I want to bring up uh, from uh, across the Atlantic. I want to bring up Neil Mosley uh, from Cardiff University. Hello, Neil. Oh, Neil. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Fabulous, can fabulous. Nice to be here. Great. Thank you so much for coming. I, I appreciate it because it's late at night there. Yeah, you've got me out of childcare duty, so it's not a, not a problem at all. Um, <laughs> I, I, I've been reading my little boys some stories uh, usually, so um, it's okay. You've, you've kind of uh, avoided me um, and that. Um, yeah, no, it's, it's great to be here. It's really interesting hearing from a US perspective because I, I think one of the one of the things of all of this is that it, you know that it's it is so much the same here really you know we're in we're in lockdown all essential businesses closed um you know university just massively trying to grapple with all of this and I kind of agree with what a lot of people were saying I think the biggest danger um for us is I think to try to view this as business as usual but re remote and I think I think it's it's a weird it's a weird situation because you can be in your home at this stage with with it not as, not spread as much as as, as it may maybe will, um, and you can feel as if sometimes like it it's it is business as usual. It's it's a it kind of weird thing, but I think it's one of those things for for all of us. We have to kind of really think about each day resetting and saying actually this is not business as usual, but just remotely. And I think. I worry a little bit, I think, from my perspective. I, I uh, work much closer with, with faculty and students, and I, I worry that we're not being flexible enough. I worry about our capacity to, uh, to, to cope with 2021 because of all the kind of mass efforts that are going into dealing with a move to remote teaching and how we deal with assessment. And if we're not wise and flexible and compassionate on the assessment side of things, then, you know, we could get into all manner of difficulty um, around um, student kind of buy-in and, and student feeling towards us as an institution. So, you know, um, I, I mean, irrespective of that, my concern is our capacity to kind of plan and deal effectively with 2021. Um, but I think it's incumbent on all of us to really just reset each day and because the danger is for me you know there's 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 so much things going around that I'm passionate about in online education and design and all that kind of stuff that you know it's so easy to kind of get hooked into that and to start to kind of tag that onto the maybe the agenda or the thing that you were thinking anyway about um, higher ed and not step back and say actually you know this is much bigger than than my agenda and it's about people um, and I think it, it challenges it challenges higher ed to think about the things that we knew were problems already. Homogenizing our students, I think, is a big is a big one for me. And thinking, you know, I think in the UK we do have this kind of picture of a classic undergraduate student, um, and it's usually someone who's pretty pretty sort of middle class, pretty pretty wealthy, pretty in a, in probably in a position. I think Robin picked on this picked up on this as uh, to be kind of most sheltered maybe from some of the things that are going on mm -hmm. and I think we just have to challenge ourselves um, in the way that we approach dealing with it but also the way that we think about students as you know a huge variety and a huge variety of different circumstances um, and yeah I mean in, in respect to what 2021 looks like um, I mean I I, I I'd love to. I'd love to. I'd love to know what the, what the answer is. So if well, anyone's got one, that'd be great. <laughs> some ideas. Um, and, hey, Brian. One one thing um, when I was talking to people for, about what makes a resilient university and kind of the signs of that, people talk. I heard somebody say something pretty smart about. Uh, I think it was somebody from Tulane university who talked about you have you have to do disaster planning and sort of you know scenario planning mm -hmm. and what i thought was so interesting the way he phrased it was you don't just make a disaster plan once and then that's your disaster plan you you make that disaster plan and then you continue to adjust that plan for various scenarios along the way it's like you don't you know yeah. and that's kind of what the situation is everyone's in right now you have to you know make a plan and then three weeks later adjust it and it's mm -hmm. part of Adaptable. It's, it's, I think that's one of the things that will help us all 
help all institutions yeah, I, keep going. It's exhausting. Yeah, I like the framework idea because I think, again, the focus can be too much a little bit on what, how we're going to teach. And for me, it's kind of well, what's the experience going to look like for students that study with us in 2021 and like holistically, because um, it's such a broad, complex kind of problem that we're facing. This is Yeah, you set goals and you set values and then you figure out at the time, you know, goals and values can be sort of fixed and they can still be North Stars. But that then, you know, then you adjust to circumstances and that's where some of that, you know, incremental thinking might come to play. True. And I really think um, one of the things that's been most helpful to me is that um, my staff is very small at our in our teaching and learning center. Um, and we're actually outnumbered by the students who work in our teaching and learning center. And um, they've all been very desperate to keep their hours because they're, they've are they lost most of their other jobs. Um, so they're still working for us remotely. And I think because I spend so much time hearing their stories, um, I just think when we're making these disaster plans and retooling them all the time, instead of doing what you were talking about before, where we really try to hide our um, vulnerabilities from our students and, our, and their families and the people who pay and choose us um, as consumers, we need to involve them as uh, people who help us make those plans because unless we're listening to the stories that are coming from these, I mean, we used to have a diverse demographic. It's, it's almost diversified even more now that they're learning from so many different kinds of places um, that I think involving students as partners and the planning and actually uh, family members as well will be really helpful to us. The bigger our communication line is with our students um, and the more they're actually asked to help redesign the curriculum, honestly, for, for the new modalities, um, they have much better information than we do about how they're able to connect how they're able to participate um, and how they best learn under these conditions. So hiding from them the challenges is actually going to really shoot us in the in the foot, I think, in the collective yeah. institutional foot. These are these are great, great thoughts. Uh, and and they t we, we have a whole torrent of questions that have come in and, and they key off of some of the things you've just been saying in the past couple of minutes. Uh, and I want to bring a couple of these up, but I'm, I'm also a little conscious of time because we have such an embarrassment of riches in, in, in all of you. Uh, this is from Christian Eshelman, uh, who has a, a great question, um, which is, uh, Robin, and I think this applies to everybody, uh, what changes in structure and communications can help our faculty embrace uncertainty in emerging decision making? Also embrace a need for greater flexibility in our models. Well, I mean, the cool thing, and, and, and Kristen works a lot on this kind of stuff as well. I mean, the cool thing is a lot of us have been really interested in um, emergent uh, design and also in involving students in participation in, in, in the emergent design of curriculum for a long time. Sure. Um, but now many more faculty have come to the table suddenly um, with an interest in being more flexible and uh, listening more to students. So to a certain degree, there's a um, we had this learning community going on, on at Plymouth that had, you know, I think 70 or so participants is very robust. Um, and what we found is that the faculty were in that learning community, which was focused on three things, um, integrated learning, project based learning and open education. And of course, open education is very much about using technology in ways that empower learners to be in the driver's seat of their educations. Yeah. Faculty who are in that learning community just they were great when this hit they knew how to communicate with their students they knew how to talk with their students and lots of other faculty saw i think the the ways that those leaders um were rallying mm -hmm. um so i would say you have an in right now to a certain degree with a larger c community than you might have before um but i think one of the key ways to do that is to build safe places for faculty um, where they can come together uh, with students as best you can to talk about emergent learning. And so we've been doing that for a year, really served us well. But if you don't have, um, and I know Kristen does, but for those who don't have teaching and learning centers that focus um, particularly on 
things like open education or project-based or inquiry-based learning and thinking about technology that serves pedagogy rather than letting your IT department drive the conversion. Put that with your teaching and learning folks. And if you don't have teaching and learning folks, advocate to, to get them. Um, so I know like Josh Eiler is here somewhere. I think I saw um, a little bobbing head. Um, people have done great work sort of talking about, uh, Jesse Samuel I saw in there. Um, we have Martha Burtis with me in the collab at Plymouth. Uh, you know, these are folks who have really helped people realize that a teaching and learning center is not a place where you're going to get evaluated in your teaching or where you're going to learn to teach better. It's a community of practice yeah. for because nobody is going to be able to just change their mindset in a week and a half. So you need to offer faculty development that's about that kind of mindset training, right? So instead of everything focusing on content delivery, and that's the problem we've seen with this pivot to remote learning, right? All the conversations about how to get my content delivered in a new package. But it's the modality, right? It's the way you connect. It's the way you build the channels that matters. And that's actually pedagogy, not content. So if you don't have those pedagogy conversations somewhere in your institution, all you're going to do is move content online. And you know what? Uh, there's a lot of institutions who moved their content online a long time ago, and they do it better, and they do it faster. They do it cheaper. That's not what most of our small colleges are all about. It's not the connection. Um, thank you, Robin. Uh, and thank you, Kristen, for a, a great question. Um, and uh, along the way, you've given a bunch of shout outs to a bunch of fantastic forum participants and guests. Thank you. Um, speaking of which, we have another question from Canada. Uh, and this is from Stephen Downs, uh, who says, what do, when we say think about the public good and focus on the margins, are we thinking of people within the higher education community or does this extend beyond that community? How? And I think this touches on things that every one of you said when Goldie, when you were talking about the porous uh, institution. Uh, and Neil, we were talking about trying to rethink who the students are and where they're coming from. And of course, uh, Robin, the source of all of this. Uh, what do you think about that? I'll, I'll put the question back up so we can think about it. I, I mean, I would say that the fault lines that have been exposed during the pandemic show us, number one, who the most vulnerable people in our institutions are, but then it, they also can really highlight who the people who aren't even being served at all. Um, so I would like to see this be a bit of a wake up call. I think these questions are related to questions about free college, um, mm -hmm. about all those kinds of things that we talk about outside of it. I do personally believe that there's a role for publicly funded institutions, formal institutions, um, like a, a government response that says an investment in education pays off for the the community work by people like philip trostel say an economist from from maine who writes about the the benefits to regions right when you invest in public higher ed all those things are related totally to the public health crisis i think and to questions of medicare for all and so i'm thinking about yes there's vulnerable people in our communities right now but because of the way higher ed is still a bastion for the privileged because it's out of reach. You know, people like Sarah Goldrick Rabb's research, we know it's out of reach for so many people. To me, this virus just brought that front and center when I saw like how many of my own students are already gone. They were, they were precarious in the institution and now they're gone. In the last two weeks, they're gone, right? Um, so you really see that line between who can participate and who cannot participate right now in higher ed. I read the New York Times editorial today, that, that new series that the Times editorial page is going to start about talking about just kind of like, what does this, it wasn't prompted only by the pandemic, but it's sort of been heightened also by the pandemic. Like what, what does our society of need right now? And it, I was trying to think what the higher ed piece of that was. And it, to me, it was at some level more than that debate about free college is just sort of a narrow way of thinking about it. I just began to think, I haven't quite figured it out yet, though. Um, where, I mean, I mean, I still like to think of higher ed as a public good, but I think there's been a lot of examples in American higher education, at least, where that's not, it's not seen as a public good. It's, you know, not this is not just a private good conversation, but it's just really seen as, you know, this thing that costs you a lot of money to go to and it doesn't 
it, the research doesn't isn't obviously benefiting the people and the you know, the the turn the way students are graduating isn't necessarily benefiting the public. I feel like there is probably a role for some big big reset on higher ed and its role in society, and that's probably a public perception problem, but also probably something that <laughs> higher ed's going to have to try to undertake in the middle of trying to deal with everything else right now. Good point. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't know whether we have the same um, perception um, in the UK as the US for higher ed, but I think this gives us an opportunity around civic mission um, and and what we offer to our society. Because I think ultimately, you know, a lot of universities in the UK who are um, not in great financial shape are going to need some help to pull to get through this. And you know, the the governments and the bodies who may seek to come in and help, um, you know, quite might quite rightly ask for more from universities in terms of public good um, and what they can do um, alongside that. You know, we have a university uh, hospital. So, you know, our students are really kind of uh, getting involved in helping um, yeah. helping with the crisis. But I think absolutely it gives it gives university opportunities. And people have talked about, you know, the perception of universities and how they deal with that. And I think that, you know, elevating some of the good things that we do already and looking at extending those things maybe in response to help from government i think is, is going to be important two two great writers that i love on this are Tressie mcmillan caught him uh, mm -hmm. her book lower ed i think does mm -hmm. works on this really well as and in a totally different way kathleen fitzpatrick's book generous thinking you know both of those are about um who can and is able to and is allowed to and should privilege be uh privilege and benefit from public higher ed so they're they're great great writers on this they are and uh great books great folks and and two great future transform guests that we've had <laughs> um, we uh friends we are running really low on time and i wanted to quickly share a couple of comments that came up uh, rather than questions uh, naomi toffin says duct tape education is leaving behind students with different abilities um and exclamation point is hers and uh, and that's quite right um we have a uh, uh, hollis um uh robbins um, points out that athletics and sports basically can't really uh, continue next year. Uh, and this is a problem for so many institutions being structured around sports. Um, and uh, on, a, on a lighter, uh, although perhaps more painful note, um, uh, Mark Rush notes that um, his son says that closer access to his dad jokes enhances his critical thinking ability. Um, that, that may count as a human rights violation, I'm not sure. Um, um, but, uh, but thank you. Thank you for that, Mark. Um, and we have uh, a, a whole series of other questions, friends, and I'm afraid that we are really um, out of time. Uh, I do want to bring up uh, one more of these notes just to think about. Uh, this is a really, really good one uh, from Brian Mulligan. Are we a little too focused on goals, quality of the experience when the president is worried about income and costs? And I I want to put that out there because it's, that's almost a divide that has come up in the, in the course of our conversation. Um, on the one hand, the, these, these views of, of uh, our ethics and, uh, and our practice versus the financial clobbering that uh, is just starting to hit us. Um, Brian, that's a good point. Um, I don't want to let people go, though, without a, a couple of uh, last thoughts from all of you. First of all, first of all um, looking ahead to 2021, what is the most likely configuration of higher education that you see? And give everyone a shot at this. And uh, Neil, you get to go first uh, because I brought you on last. Great. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I think we're going to have to reduce the amount of programs that we run. I think that's inevitable. Um, I, I it's very. I I don't really. I know that people are talking, uh, have talked about emergency remote te teaching and have said basically for September time, we're going to need something a lot more polished. I don't think we're going to be in that place. So I think whatever contingency is going to continue on the same basis. I think um, the, I think just to echo what other people said, institutions being transparent and having the mentality of that we're all in this together, I think is going to help. But I think there's going to be some reduction, I think, in terms of what we the volume of what we do um I, I i for one hope that there's going to be some partnership between universities to deal with this as well and working together a bit more but um yeah uh, i i haven't got a crystal ball on this sadly 
Who is Brian? I don't know. We don't need Brian going? to run this show. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, do you want to go I ahead, Bradley? I mean, I had to Did my screen except- just go black for a second? Yeah. It does that one time. It's like a, a ritual I have to go through. Um, Neil, thank you uh, for yeah, the I, points. I'm, I'm wondering, Goldie, what, what are the two main factors that you can see in uh, higher ed in 2021? Smaller enrollments across the board. Yeah. And um, a lot of economic upheaval at the inst- at every level of, for students, for institutions. Um, and um, for the professors, in fact. Um, I mean, I actually would love to know what people are thinking. I put this call out before. I mean, I do that new weekly newsletter, and my email is goldie at chronicle.com. So write to me, and if you have some thoughts about topics I should be exploring more. I'm, I mean, I'm not the answer woman. I like to ask, I'm a reporter, so I'm still asking everybody else, but I'd love to hear from folks about what um, they're hearing and what topics they think are important for me to be exploring in that newsletter. It's a great newsletter. And Goldie is a great writer. Thank you, Goldie. And Robin, what what are two features of 2021 that you anticipate? Um, I I anticipate nothing, but I I hope for um, public funding of the public good in both health and education. Um, And I also hope for us to be guided by a framework focused on adaptability, connection, and equity. I feel like if we keep those three things in mind, uh, we'll build a strong strong system, Um, but it won't be free and we can't do it from the the red. (laughs) Good point of being being public, thank you. Uh, Quickest quickest question for, Goldie, we know about your uh, newsletter. Um, Neil, what's the best way to find you online? Best way to find me online is Twitter. So Neil Mosley five on Twitter. Very good. Thank you. And uh, Robin, what's uh, is Twitter the best way to find you now? Yes, at Actual Ham. So it's the best handle online, I think. I think. Um, uh, and thank you so much. Thank you to all three guests. I, you guys are fantastic, and I want to bring you all right back um, because you have so much good stuff to talk about. And my thanks to everybody who participated in this conversation. We have a stack of questions. I'm going to archive them and share them later because they are very, very rich. Um, Thank you all for everyone who came up on stage and joined us too. And a shout out to everyone on Twitter. It looks like Twitter has been burning up with the hashtag FTTE. Thank you for tweeting out. Before you go, uh, I want to mention two upcoming events. Uh, One is that tomorrow uh, I'm working with the Chronicle of Higher Education to do a, a live video event on faculty work-life balance during the crisis. Uh, so head to tinyurl.com slash chronicle 4-10, uh, and you can sign up for that. Again, that's tomorrow from 3 to 4 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. Uh, next week, next Thursday, uh, the forum is going to dive into education online uh, during the pandemic, and we're going to focus on two different parts of that. One is teaching, and one is libraries. We have great guests who are expert in both of those fields with a lot of great news. Now, if you want to keep talking about all this stuff, as you can see from our opening poll, uh, Twitter seems to be our leading goal. So just use hashtag FTTE and keep this rolling. And of course, if you want to join us in our Facebook, LinkedIn, or Slack groups, please just join us or ping me and we'd be glad to see you there. Uh, In the meantime, uh, we have our our archive going back years and years of previous sessions touching everything from equity to mobile education to open education resources. And if you want to stay in touch, please do. We'd be glad to hear from you. Thank you all for all of your thoughts. Please stay safe. Keep thinking ahead, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.